Well, welcome everybody. Uh, you are uh, you are joining us for lockdown advocacy, maintaining and engaging your socially your socially isolated advocacy networks. Now that's a tongue twister, but welcome. We're glad that you're here with us. We have uh, a great group of panelists this morning. And uh, we are just excited to be presenting this webinar series to you. So thank you for registering. One of the things that really motivated us to do this, uh, the, the governor of New York here in the United States uh, canceled the primaries. Now in the United States, the primaries, uh, of course, pick the candidates that are going to be on the general election ballot. Uh, he wouldn't have the authority to cancel the general election, but each state kind of controls how it runs its uh, selection process. So, but, but of course that takes people out of the loop. That takes the average voter out of the loop. And um, candidates are probably trying to figure out how to reach their voters too. And uh, not just candidates, but people who are advocates for causes, people who uh, want to reach out to the public to get activation of an issue to motivate and lobby Congress, uh, whatever it might be. And so, um, this is a panel, this whole webinar series is really about how do we engage in democracy? How do we be a government that's help, that the people help direct uh, during a time when everyone's cloistered in their homes or not allowed to go for public gatherings and no one can go door to door without being uh, looked at, you know, someone looking out the window and saying, how dare you come to my door, you're going to infect me. So, so uh, politics is very different today. And so that's what these panels are about. I'm looking forward to what our panelists, many years of experience among these folks, uh, what they have to share with us. Before we go any further, let me say that this uh, webinar series is sponsored by the Robertson School of Government at Regent University. And uh, our school offers master's degrees in uh, government, in national security studies, and in public administration. And uh, we also have, our, for our bachelor's programs, the Department of Government, His History, and Criminal Justice. And uh, so I have asked our um, uh, my assistant, uh, Anita Reed, who's with us on the, online here, to post in our chat room some links to our programs at Regent University for anyone who would like to look at those. All right, without further ado, uh, we are going to start this morning. Uh, we are a faith-based institution. We're gonna start by asking the Dean of our School of Divinity, Dr. Corne Becker, to offer a word of prayer for us and just to bless the day and our webinar sessions today. Would you do that, Dr. Becker? Thank you so much, Dr. Perry. What a joy and privilege to be joined this morning. Uh, folks, let us say a word of prayer. Most high and glorious God, Enlighten the darkness of our hearts. Give us correct faith, certain hope, and perfect charity. Give us sense and understanding so that we might carry out your most perfect will. And Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus, through the power of your Spirit, we pray that you would unite this country. Lord, that you would help us to remember those who are vulnerable amongst us. The sick, the poor, the stranger. And Lord, would you use us to stand for the virtues of righteousness and holiness and temperance. We pray this in the holy name of God. Amen. Thank you so much, Dr. Becker. We appreciate you joining us to do that this morning. So just to give you a little bit uh, of housekeeping for those of you attending. So this session uh, will go for about the next hour and uh, the, our panelists will, will discuss. At, at an hour in, we will have time for questions and answers from you, the audience. So at the bottom of your screen, you should see a and a button. And if you go and click on the Q&A button, you can post a question to our panelists. And our co-moderator today, Kylan Griffith, will, uh, will be selecting some of those questions. And then when it gets toward the end, she will uh, present some of those to our panel and uh, they can respond to your questions in the last half hour. Then when we get, uh, so after about 90 minutes, we will break. Uh, we have then 90 minutes of break, and we will come back at what is 1 p.m. here in the eastern United States. Uh, so it's Greenwich Mean Time minus four, if that helps anybody, wherever you are. Um, 
and, and so you can adjust and, and we have a second panel that'll be later on today, finding and reaching your majority from at least six feet away uh, with some, some top panelists again on that panel. Uh, and it includes Corey Lewandowski, who, who is uh, fairly prominent in terms of the Trump 2016 campaign. And he's the chief, uh, the, the senior consultant to the Trump 2020 campaign as well. So uh, it'll be a great panel again this afternoon. So we invite you to be with us now and to come back again later today for our second panel. Our moderator for this session today is uh, Dr. Nicholas Higgins. Uh, Nick Higgins is a, an associate professor in uh, the Department of Government History and Criminal Justice at Regent University. He uh, has experience working with campaigns uh, across uh, several states at the state level. And, um, I'm, <laughs> and I have his bio right in front of me. And of course, uh, the, uh, there it is. Okay, <laughs> uh, so he teaches, he teaches and writes on American politics and political theory. Uh, and he has served as a campaign manager for state level campaigns. And he also has worked on Capitol Hill. So uh, welcome Dr. Higgins, sorry for botching your bio there, but uh, Dr. Higgins will be introducing our panelists for us today. Thank you, Dr. Perry. And it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you for all our audience that's here and particularly for our panelists. Um, I think we have a very distinguished group of panelists, people who have served in office, people who have supported those who served, and then consultants. And so I'm going to introduce our panelists in no particular order. This is just the, the order of the things in front of me. Uh, and then we're going to launch into our conversation. So uh, first panelist that we have is Gintar Navakut. Uh, she's a recognized professional of international and external relations, currently leading several wide-scale projects in the Eastern Partnership Program. Since 2012, she's been a director for international affairs at the Ronald Reagan House, a think tank dedicated to promoting and publicizing the principles of freedom, democracy, and free enterprise. She served as a foreign secretary of the Homeland Union uh, of the Lithuanian Christian Democrats, the main center-right political party of Lithuania and a member of the European People's Party. Uh, and just a moment ago, she said that she has also been nominated just recently for, uh, I believe it was a uh, parliament at uh, the Lithuanian level. Is that, is that correct, Gwintar? That's the National Parliament of Lithuania. The National Parliament of Lithuania. So she has a, a lot of experience as a candidate and obviously as someone who has thought deeply about politics. Um, our next panelist that we have is Matthew Brownfield. Matthew Brownfield is the founding partner of Murphy Naskia. Uh, he launched Naskia Consulting Services in 2009, one of the first Republican consulting firms to specialize in candidate uh, campaign technology and door-to-door -door communications. He has engineered strategy management and operations of hundreds of successful campaigns. Um, and he's served as a senior strategist for clients specializing in voter mobilization. He holds a bachelor's degree in government from Patrick Henry College and a master's in politics from the University of Dallas. He lives in Austin, Texas with his wife, Lauren, and three uh, wonderful daughters. I would also like to introduce Latoya Haight, Latoya Haight is a alumnus here at Regent University, class of 2019, with a master's in American government. She's a proud community advocate and works hard to ensure the Christian leadership does indeed change the world, echoing Regent's motto. She's currently the regional director for the third district of Virginia for the Trump victory and the director of member relations of Blexit, a conservative nonprofit dedicated to changing the narrative of minority communities. Uh, and then we also have, uh, pulling up, I apologize, Annalie, I'm looking for your information here. There we are. We have Annalie Madrano. She is a formerly a Bernie 2020 Los Angeles Regional Field Director. She's won key congressional districts and mobilized Latino voters in California. Her years of experience in the fight for progressive policies in the legislative and electoral process continues as she builds organizing power to hold corporations and elected leaders that fail to put the working class first. She has worked on several statewide campaigns, including U.S. Senator Kamala Harris's uh, 
to ensure to uh to secure the democrat party by an unprecedented 78 percent of the vote during her 2016 senate campaign as a student advocate Anna Lee was elected to represent over 2.3 million students at the student senate for california community colleges from 2012 to 2014. she's in the first in her family to earn a four-year degree raised in an immigrant household by a single mother from el salvador and she continues to work to improve the lives of marginalized black and brown families by building stronger coalitions. We also have with us Sam Patton. Sam Patton is a writer and political strategist who has worked extensively in the United States and globally. At home, he has played key roles in political campaigns for the US Senate to the White House. He was instrumental in the election of Maine Republican Susan Collins and ran statewide operations for the Bush Cheney ticket of 2000. Since then, he has advised candidates across America. In the Bush administration, he served as a senior advisor to the State Department on democracy promotion and ran political operations for the International Republican Institute in Iraq. And then finally, uh, that everybody, no, uh, Edward Priola. Thank you, Edward, sorry. Uh, Dr. Edward Priola serves as the campaign school director for the North Carolina State Republican Party. He has been teaching communication courses at the University of Maryland's global campus since 2010 and is the senior lecturer at the University of Maryland College Park from 2012 to 2019. He's also worked as an adjunct communication professor for several higher education institutions in Maryland, Virginia, and the District of Columbia. Uh, his experience includes overseas assignments in Romania, Albania, uh, for affiliates of USAID and other democracy building organizations. And he's served at... Uh, he received a White House appointment to the U.S. Department of Agriculture in 1989 and several years in the Public Affairs Director of the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation. Uh, he holds a Doctor of Management from University of Maryland and a Master's Degree in Organizational Communication from Bowie State and a Bachelor's from uh, SUNY New Paltz. So thank you all uh, for being here. Uh, I appreciate this and, and you know, I, I'm sorry for the long introduction, but I, I think it's important to recognize for our audience that you all have been involved in this and are able to speak both from experience and long range knowledge. What I would like to do is uh, actually start with a, a question. Uh, I'm gonna direct it primarily to Matt Brownfield and to uh, Sam uh, Patton to begin with, although others would be feel free to jump in. This panel is focusing obviously on communicating to your groups, particularly while we are in lockdown. Uh, and as many of you know, last week, uh, uh, Congressman Justin Amash of Michigan announced he was seeking the Libertarian Party's candidacy for president. And in so doing, in an interview on NPR, he made an offhanded comment that he thinks the current lockdown is advantageous for third party candidates and for candidates that are, uh, if you don't have the same institutional structures, because it's a leveling democratic field where you can reach people more directly. And so if I can just start uh, with Sam and then Matthew, do you all think that the current lockdown is actually a benefit to candidates that are not incumbents and that are seeking to kind of challenge the dominant narrative that currently exists? And why do you think that's the case? Well, absolutely. I think Congressman Amash had a good point. Um, I don't know about incumbents. I mean, incumbents always do have the advantage, the incumbency of office, particularly with the president and the president, uh, you know, the country is looking to the president for leadership at this time. But if you look at the other major party candidates, uh, we see the, uh, the Democrat uh, presumptive nominee broadcasting from his basement. And uh, that essentially that levels the playing field uh, where any other candidate is operating from a similar platform. And uh, we're looking at an audience, a political audience of likely voters across the country who are hungry, not only for news and information, uh, but something that will give them hope, something that will be a little bit different uh, in a time that, you know, things are very different. So uh, uh, very much uh, there's, a, there's, there's a leveling of the playing field. And there's also a sense that, you know, now is the time to get back to basics. Um, and that's, uh, you know, in, in a time where every single news story talks, with, talks about coronavirus, it's, uh, it's hard to talk about anything but coronavirus. Um, so people want to hear about things that affect them 
in their homes and their communities on their streets. And the candidate who can do that uh, is going to get the most attention. And oftentimes that can be the candidate uh, who is the least insulated uh, by a large structure. So uh, I think that uh, we, we certainly live in an interesting time for campaigning. Thank you, Sam. Uh, Matthew, you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think not to make too light of this, but I feel like it might take like a global pandemic and an economic recession for libertarians to have any chance at anything. Um, and, you know, so, I mean, it, I guess in as much as, as they have a slightly better chance than they've had before, uh, I guess, uh, Congressman Amash could, you know, could, you could say that, um, in general though, about your points about incumbents, um, you know, we've actually found that incumbents right now have a bit of a structural advantage if they engage with their constituents. Um, because they're the people that can actually do something. Um, you know, if you're in a situation where we work, we represent a lot of folks in districted races, whether that be for state legislature or federal races, well, if you're an incumbent right now, you have something to do. Um, you know, you, you can help people with, especially at the state level, you can help people with unemployment. Mm -hmm. um, you can help people at the federal level to understand the PPP and the impact that that's going to have on their business. Uh, and you can be very engaged with your constituents right now. I mean, what we've done for in, in helping a lot of our candidates is we've had them really focus their communication efforts on being a resource um, and basically using their campaign apparatus to extend their constituent service operation so that they can go in and, and really talk to a lot of people because all of a sudden, you know, it's sort of easy at different points to be an elected official in the United States. Uh, you have to campaign hard. It's difficult to raise money. But for a long time and for a lot of members of Congress or for different members of the legislature, there isn't something that you're necessarily doing every day. Um, but it, when you're in this environment with this kind of challenge, you have something you can be doing daily. And we really have been encouraging people to use the different online apparatus that they have available, the different mediums to extend their operation out to their constituents. So I think it, it, it's gonna be actually to maybe revise what he said, uh, what the Congressman said, you know, if, if you're a good incumbent, there's actually never been a better opportunity for you to reach out to your constituents. If you're not as engaged, it's going to show even more uh, in an environment like this. Thank you, Matthew. Gwintar, I was wondering if, if you would provide a little bit of comments, obviously, as, as you're seeking for the national legislator, what types of things are you able to not do that you wish you could do? And what things are you able to do uh, at this time? Well, first of all, I would like to begin with the fact that um, I'm also the headman of the town. So it's also in my direct responsibility, you know, to keep in contact regarding some certain issues um, with, uh, with my own local people and uh, to be the mediator with the governmental institutions at the same time. Um, so frankly speaking, uh, regarding uh, the environment of pandemics, uh, I'm really happy as a consultant uh, from the angle of getting an opportunity to become really really creative when it comes to my own campaign and i think that you know particularly cre creativeness and um, creativity and the new ideas and you know something that it's been unseen the methods that are you know well known working well for for um, for many years in combination with unseen is usually something you know that really helps the candidates to win the elections and now in this environment in this political environment that we are having we are actually forced to look for the uh for the creative decisions so me frankly i'm, I'm really excited for what's up upcoming i'm really ready to jazz it up with my own campaign and i'm also ready to give uh, solutions for other candidates inside my party um, but then at the same time, what I see uh, happening in the other parties is that we are really lacking of the content in the uh, times of crisis. This is actually now the time when we have to 
speak up with the and come up with the real problem uh, solutions. Only those ideas that are very loud and uh, and you know, and innovative uh, can actually reach out to the audience. Because as some uh, one of you already mentioned, the especially social media is really packed with anything uh, which has to do with COVID nineteen. So for you to actually be heard in those uh, media channels is, you know, you have to be even louder than you were before. Um, and if you weren't, you know, it's, it's really not time. So, and my, my also good advice for that would be, you know, if you don't really know how to get the attention uh, for yourself in case you are a candidate, you know, just stop posting uh, everything that you eat and every push up that you do, unless this is your work, uh, your direct work, because otherwise, it really does not look uh, professional and it's really not what people are willing to see at this moment. They want to see concrete solutions. Uh, they want to see uh, people or hear our politicians and uh, lawmakers to actually speak of how we are going to balance the global economy. I think this is the most important issue which is upcoming. Uh, that's first. Secondly, questions of ecology and education both will be will be topping um, topping the media, but that's for European countries. American uh, American math is a little bit uh, different to that, and I think that you know if I would if I could also reflect a little bit on um, a mass uh, candidacy. Um, for us, what we are looking from the other side of the ocean, we would really like to hear, you know, his uh, views on foreign policies. That's, you know, first and uh, and foremost uh, issue. Um, then at the same time, he was naming his himself as libertarian candidate, which I do not clearly see happening. You know, many conservatives are actually libertarian by, uh, you know, by heart with their mind, with, you know, ideologies that they believe in. I could not see at this moment that Amash is actually a libertarian candidate. I can really sense uh, bits of, you know, socialism, especially speaking of, you know, equality everywhere and for everyone and for every human being walking on earth, you know, so it's quite many different angles uh, from which we are looking as foreigners. At the right. same time, you know, what we are liking to see in a country like United States of America is actually stability. So Trump sure. was, all, you know, something that, you know, we did not know what to expect from him because he was quite new when it comes to politics. Sure. Now, well, thank you. after Guitar, sorry. Years, Guitar, I yeah, apologize to interrupt. I, I'm gonna, I need to go to the other panelists just to give everyone equal time, but I, I, I appreciate some of these inputs. And, and I want to just remind our audience that they can ask questions down in the chat. And, you know, I'm trying to make sure people have, uh, you know, playing moderator, I apologize for cutting people off, but we're trying to make sure that uh, people can get their points. And I, I think Wintar made some really good observations. And so actually I wanna go to Annalie and then Edward and then Latoya. Uh, and I'm gonna start with you, Annalie. Uh, one thing Wintar mentioned is that with all of the COVID news that's going on, that it seems very hard to break through with your message through kind of all the noise that's out there. So I'm kind of curious, how have you been working and doing that uh, for your candidates specifically? And again, we want this to be able to applicable to not just one candidate, uh, but really for anyone who's running for office of any party. Uh, so what have you been doing to kind of break through the noise? And uh, has it been in your mind harder or easier than in the past? Thank you. Um Specifically, when it comes to a lot of the different breakthrough, a lot of the specific supporters in the Bernie Sanders campaign were impacted um, the most when it comes to the pandemic. Specifically, we have been restructuring how to continue to um, break through connecting with specific people that have never participated in elections before. And so voter education was first and foremost one of the biggest critical programs that we needed to build out. And then on the second portion of making sure that people are breaking through, you have to build capacity of a solid volunteer of network to be able to reach out to those individuals. And so specifically when it came down to making sure that we are reaching out um, to those individuals, we did numerous phone banking operations and we mostly did virtual house parties 
our virtual phone banks during the pandemic. And so we really did see specifically the feedback from our callers, the feedback from the constituents was that, you know, there was a high definition of anxiety, depression, people specifically solid super volunteers themselves were getting um, diagnosed with COVID-19. Mm. So we have to be realistic about being culturally sensitive, but at the same time aware that these individuals might um, right now might not necessarily be 100% focused in campaigning. And so what we had to do is we had to restructure a rapid response within the campaign. And so what we were able to do was provide new resources to do COVID response relief efforts. And so we were able to form coalitions with individuals giving actual um, donations to these communities. And so when we were able to break through and do solidarity calls, the, sol the solidarity calls one allowed us to break through with those specific voters or potential volunteers. And then once we were able to organize in that virtual setting, then we could become more strategic about how we're gonna be able to contact voters. Because if you're gonna be contacting voters, you do need to have a solid core of volunteers that are gonna be able to build that capacity to make those one-on-one -on -one connections. Because right now you're not gonna be able to go through just a regular social media campaign. You have to have actual um, volunteer core program to build up that solid core of support. And so that's something that we really had to struggle with in the beginning of the stages when the CDC said no more rallies, no more door-to-door -door operations, because that's how the progressive movement and our strategy was really becoming a lot more sustainable because we did reach out to non-traditional voters that wouldn't be touched through regular social media. Uh, thank you so much, Annalie. That, that raises a good point. Edward, I'm going to come to you as, as someone who thinks about communication uh, pretty clearly. You know, it seems that obviously the COVID situation has caused people to rethink things. And I think it was Sam had mentioned that there is kind of a, a back to basics where you're, you're phone banking, you're not able to go door to door, but you're not able to have these rallies. So it's a lot more of this one on one. Uh, and, and therefore, it's, it's kind of time, uh, time, you, it takes a lot of time to do some of these, these campaigns, so you're not able to reach the same amount of people as, as quickly. So Edward, I'm just curious uh, from your input and thoughts on this, how do you think candidates can successfully do this kind of rejiggered back to basics campaign and what should they focus on? Well, I, I, I think we, we moving back a little bit in our conversation. It, it, uh, the last speaker just made a very good point of the town square, metaphorically speaking, has been reduced and reduced over, over the past decade and two decades. Uh, door to door, well, clearly you don't do that these days. Uh, it's, it's near impossible. Rallies are are closed down. But even before that, we had cell phones overtaking the landlines and, and the direct calls or candidates uh, like myself in 2010 reaching out and making literally thousands of calls over campaigning over the course of a year, uh, knocking on doors, meeting folks just face to face. The town square, uh, you know, to the theme of, of our discussion today, is shrinking. The good news, of course, is that we have the new opportunities of what we're doing now, today, Zoom. This is my Zoom room. So this is the opportunity that I have to outreach to, to candidates. Uh, if the candidates can use the opportunities to get outside of the silos, uh, then we can be successful in communicating. But it's all the fundamentals to ask your answer your question, Nick. The same fundamentals apply. You've got to have a message. You've got to have the message and communicate it in a way that communicates to the needs of the voters you're trying to communicate with. And you've got to get outside your normal circle of, of uh, Republicans or Democrats or, or Libertarians. I think you've also got to consider campaigning in the United States in particular at different levels. We've got the, uh, the presidential level and, and the state United States Senate level, uh, they're at a different league. Uh, resources are abundant uh, for most of them. Uh, to answer your question about uh, Congressman Amash, uh, I think it's closer to a 15 minutes of fame. Uh, I don't expect it to change, but largely based on the resources and, and the expectations of two, one of the two major party candidates to succeed. 
But at the down ballot level, there are many opportunities should the candidates avail themselves of, of the new technologies. They, it's, here we go to the metaphor. It's, it's kind of like learning how to fly the plane, train the pilots to fly the plane, build the plane, and, and uh, get to where you want to go with the airplane in, in terms of the new technology technology. It's not easy, but you can do all of those things if you manage to communicate from the fundamental basis of a message, and the message has to ring and resonate, of course, uh, based on empirical evidence with the people you're trying to persuade. The best thing that candidates at the down ballot, ballot level can do these days is get outside their silo, and it's not going to happen in, in keep the metaphors coming uh, in seven uh, jumbo jet form, it's going to be more in terms of Cessna's 12, 12 folks at a time. But but if you're willing to put the time and work in, I can see an opportunity for a down ballot candidate to to succeed against a better resourced, usually an incumbent uh, candidate. Thank you so much, Edward. I, I appreciate that. Latoya, you are obviously on the ground for a, a national campaign, but you're focused on, you know, a specific area in Virginia. So kind of thinking a little bit about how you communicate to those in your area, uh, specifically reaching out to, you know, voters in the Virginia third, I think you're, you're at. How have you been trying to do that to, you know, to have not flying the jumbo jet necessarily of the, the big media messages, as, as, as Edward said, but how have you been able to reach out individual voters or, you know, small groups of voters during this time? Um, I, we uh, um, are the Trump team over here. We believe the volunteers have been invaluable um, to the campaign strategy and able to connect with them on a more personal level um, besides just the big rallies and, you know, the, the, the events, the voter registration events where it's, you know, a mass of people. At this point, I'm not on a one-on-one -on -one level and, and see why their interest is there. And then at that point to kind of train them into becoming, you know, a team leader at that point who will bring in more volunteers to help out on the you know, social media or virtual aspect of it, rather it be phone banking or virtual town halls. Um, I do believe um, nobody likes politics. You know, people just hate talking about politics. It's just one of those things. So not talking necessarily about politics, but getting involved with policies is what I've been doing down here in the third district. A lot of people are concerned with some of the policies that are you know, being you know, talked about right now in our in our nation and pinpointing those volunteers who are passionate about certain policies and then at that point going from there to build their team up based on what they are fighting for um so just volunteers and utilizing virtual town halls to kind of replace our rallies. It's kind of a virtual rally, um, but having those, you know, black voices for Trump or Latinos for Trump or guest speakers and having a virtual town hall where all the attendees can still feel like we're, you know, having that momentum still there um, has been very important to keep our, you know, momentum and our volunteers, you know, really involved in the campaign structure. Thank you so much. So obviously the the panel is wanting to focus a little bit on social media and things. And I think as we've kind of figured out what the troubles are and, and, and how we're going back to basics, I, I wanna for a little while direct some of these responses to how either you in your role are using social media to reach out to either voters or volunteers, right? Cause those are the probably the two key demographics that right now you need to keep in contact with. You need to keep up the voters and you need to keep up the volunteers. And I think a lot of you have, have mentioned that. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to ask for maybe a one minute response from you all kind of what you're doing right now. And I'm just going to start naming people to go through that. Uh, Gwintar, can you uh, start that first? How, how are you finding that it's able to get volunteers or uh, voters through me social media or, or, or ways that since you can't shake hands uh, to interact with them directly. 
uh, first of all, Nick, just, you know, feel free to cut me anytime. You know, I'm a, I'm a speaker and I can speak a lot and a long. Uh, so uh, first of all, uh, we've been using here in Lithuania, I mean, generally speaking, uh, social media networks for many years already. Me personally, I use Zoom for several years and, you know, it's, it's the tool number one in many campaigns already. So to give you an example, I'm, me personally, I run uh, 20 Facebook pages uh, five LinkedIn accounts, you know, you name it, you name it, you name it. So you have those tools that are already working for you in different ways, targeting the different uh, voter groups. Uh, when it comes to volunteers, it's quite easy to, you know, to, to connect with them in video conferences or simply calling uh, to them. This is something that we have been doing until now. But there is one different, uh, difference that happened with the start of pandemics. It's that seniors, that uh, part of the society that was actually uh, using uh, social networks very, very um, uh, in little amounts or in little numbers, they started using uh, these platforms. And I think this is something that we really uh, be able to use um, on our on our. Uh, you know, um, good or benefit when it comes to the elections, because they will already know how to use those platforms and you will have ways how to reach out to them. Until now, it was only, you know, direct contact, uh, post, you know, things like that. So the seniors added up and that's very good. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. So I'm actually gonna ask Sam, Edward and Matthew, and we're gonna go in that order, Sam, Edward, then Matthew, to kind of address that really quickly. Obviously, there's generational gaps in the use of technology, and we know that voter turnout tends to increase with age, but obviously technological use decreases or, or changes. So I'm curious, are you all finding the communication and the ability to reach out to, uh, say, older voters, primarily like Guintar is saying, uh, how are you going about doing that? What mechanisms are, are able to be done uh, and, and how's that going? So Sam, Edward, and then Matthew. Okay, well, I, I think we can slice the, the demographic question several different ways. And older people are learning how to get online and express themselves. And, you know, particularly retired people have been catching up digitally uh, more than we might expect. Uh, I've got my, uh, my 21 year old son has been instructing my grandparents or his grandparents, my parents for several years now. And they're probably more active uh, than he is in terms of expressing themselves online today. Uh, but another way to look at the demographic question is sort of um, to look at those who follow the rules and those who don't. And I think that uh, we're, we're seeing a difference whether it's in my home state of Maine, where a uh, restaurant owner um, got on the Tucker Carlson show uh, several days ago to say that he was going to uh, uh, defy state orders and uh, open his restaurant to people uh, who wanted to uh, to get out of their house and uh, you know sit down in a restaurant and be in their community and. Um, you know, the, the state responded quickly and took away his license, uh, but he's become something of a hero in the state. And he's now making on GoFundMe $120,000 a day in contributions. Uh, and I think today he's going to reopen again. So even in America, we have this tendency where, you know, if, if the rules are too restrictive for too long, people are gonna push back. And uh, we see that uh, internationally as well. I mean, in a lot of places, uh, uh, activism and protest and advocacy has taken a little bit of a back seat as people have, have, have uh, sort of hunkered down into quarantine. In other places, they haven't. And in, in places like Iraq and Lebanon, we've seen people going out onto the streets um, because these are countries where things have been so bad for so long uh, that the quarantine and COVID is just one in a list of various problems that they've had. So uh, people have been uh, speaking out uh, in the streets in Iraq uh, against the government, what they see as endemic corruption in the government, uh, whether it's the influence of Iranians or the influence of the United States and young people in particular going out into the streets, uh, not just under threat of arrest, but under threat of being shot. And um, today, what are we, we're the 5th of May. On the 10th of May, they're expecting a million people in the streets. 
So, um, you know, there is, we're seeing a new divide between those who play by the rules and those who don't play by the rules. And we expect older people to play by the rules and younger people to, uh, you know, to, to be more rebellious. But in a way, it's in this new internet age, it's the younger people uh, who are used to a certain set of rules. And we might find the older people rebelling in ways uh, that are a little bit different than uh, we'd otherwise expect. Sure, thank you so much, Sam. Uh, Edward, any, any thoughts on, on this, you know, how to reach out to the variety of demographic groups, particularly by age in this time? Yes, but first let me echo Sam's uh, comments. I, I think he, he raised some very good points about, uh, again, to, to my metaphor, the town square is shrinking and the danger to democracy, uh, you know, it, it's, it's exposed by a lot of the fo folks, governors in particular, their overreach in many respects uh, to close down restrictions. Uh, I'm concerned that the shrinkage, uh, that there's good news, bad news, the opportunity on Facebook pretty much is, is where we uh, have folks who have opportunities, down ballot opportunities to win elections. Uh, but the problem is of course, Facebook is uh, a, uh, a a private company and uh, the regulations on Facebook have now become more restrictive and arbitrary, I would argue. If, if you're uh, uh, advocating uh, resistance to lockdown measures, overreach, uh, uh, then you were shut down on Facebook, the new rule. And that uh, to me is ominous of what can happen in the future for the, the shrinking town square. Now, now back to, to the, the folks of age differences, uh, millennials, and this is anecdotal, I, I teach several classes, uh, several undergraduate and near graduate classes, but uh, you would have thought that the millennials would, uh, in my classes would have been able to, to pick up the technology much quicker than the adult members in, in my classes. And from my experience, my observation, it's not quite true. I think that perhaps uh, their focus, the millennial folks, are, are on uh, platforms other than Facebook, uh, Pinterest and, and Snapchat and the like. And really there's been some great difficulty uh, with picking up uh, online classroom instructions. Maybe there's some resistance because they didn't want to be there in the first place. But in fact, the older folks are the ones who seem to be focused more on using the Facebook platform in particular uh, for understanding and, and uh, reaching out and understanding about the, the politics and the campaign, uh, things that where we are. One last point, uh, my, cons my focus is on instructing and working with candidates at this, this stage. It's usually the traditional cycle in campaigns that folks aren't going to pay attention after Memorial Day uh, fo or, and folks aren't going to be uh, focusing in until the 90 days at the earliest before an election. So we've got the opportunity to reach the candidates and work with them to, so that they can have the best possible message and the voters a little less emphasis at this point. Thank you so much. Uh uh, Matthew Brownfield, uh, any thoughts particularly on this? Yeah, I, I think um, anything that happens during an election cycle, no matter how small or large, has to be viewed by good campaigns as a political opportunity. Um, not to be opportunistic in a, in a bad sense, but to actually view anything that happens as something that you can bring into the scope of your campaign. Um, and what I think the, the real interesting thing right now to sort of piggyback a little bit off of, uh, off of the, the last speaker is to talk just a bit about, you know, voter attention levels right now compared to what they would be normally. Um, you know, in campaigns, it's all about resource management. And so usually we don't want to pay to both get someone's attention and to persuade them especially if you're in a down ticket or districted race. And so you do hold your advertising dollars and you do hold a lot of your, your big ticket items toward the end of the campaign where you already have voters' attention. They're already focused on the process. So then you're just paying to either persuade them or to mobilize them with your, with your uh, campaign. What we have right now is an opportunity where voter attention levels are very high. Um, people are engaging in you know, even those who are still working, um, you know, it, it sort of set aside all of those who are having to work extra outside of the house right now to take care of all of us. 
right? The frontline workers and people in the healthcare profession and folks in logistics and groceries. So setting them aside for those who are at home, either unemployed or working from home, our screen time has gone through the roof um, just in terms of, of how we're engaging with technology. People have never been more hungry for information. And that for a campaign is an opportunity, uh, really no matter the demographic, because you just have different sort of you know, medium that you reach voters on. I mean, you know, right now the, the big split is between sort of Facebook and Instagram users um, on how you split your advertising dollars. The Facebook users tending to be older, the Instagram users tending to be younger. And I don't think any of us have figured out how to really advertise or monetize TikTok yet. Um, but that'll be <laughs> next, right? You know, and then we'll just sort of keep moving down to whatever else happens, you know, and only people who are 16 above will be on Facebook. Um, so, I mean, I, I think it's about trying to hit the demographics properly and how you structure your message uh, and sort of know what the preponderance of folks, you know, their demographics are that you're talking to. But I, I think right now, again, the opportunity in this, you know, and again, not to be opportunistic, but the opportunity from a campaign is that right now people are listening. And if you have something interesting to say, and if you have something useful to say, that's going to burn in now more than it would at this point, you know, in, in an election cycle, especially for a down ticket candidate, you know, you're talking May in a presidential election year, you're at the bottom of the list of anything that anyone is thinking about. But if you can bring resources to people, if you can bring information to people, if you can show that you're, you're compassionate and engaged, at that point, people are going to remember. People always remember the folks that help in a crisis. Uh, and that's, that's what we're trying to do through the different media. Thank you so much. And again, I just want to, uh, for a moment, just remind our participants that if they have any questions that they want to ask uh, any of the panelists or just the panel as a whole, uh, in a, about 15 minutes or so, we are going to be moving to your questions for the panelists. Um, but I want to just come back to, to Annalie and Latoya really quickly and kind of ask them specifically something that Gwentar noted, which is that Gwentar said she had like 20 Facebook pages, like four LinkedIn pages. You know, uh, Matthew Brownfield mentioned, uh, obviously, not knowing how to use TikTok yet as a way to reach out, but trying to find Instagram. And, you know, there are so many electronic means to outreach. And, and so many of them have different users, right? Certain, certain types of, of mediums have different users. How has your campaigns that you've been working for decided which platforms to target and why are they targeting those platforms? And Annalie, we'll start with you and then we'll go to LaToya. Oh, yes, absolutely. So we definitely found that Facebook and Twitter have definitely been some of the most proponent um, resources that we were utilizing. Specifically, we have numerous um, different states that are running Facebook pages and they're already grassroots organizers that were hitting the ground running before we had field operations actually invested in those communities. And so what we really did find was that the solid core of volunteers have already self-organized themselves in the communities. There's been numerous different club chapters all throughout this, the country ever since the 2016 election for Bernie Sanders. And so when we were able to um, get actual campaign investments and more field on the ground, we definitely try to utilize not only social media, but also different apps. And so we had the burn app as well. And what we did see through those different mechanisms were how can we identify those leaders? In other terms, how can we identify influencers as well in the social media um, world to represent the Bernie Sanders campaign? And so it was really um, amazing how we could see how we could utilize solid core volunteers that have already started field operations and how to combine that with the new investments coming directly from the campaign. And so there's definitely going to be um, different grassroots organizations that kind of already started to do some of that groundwork. And so what we found was the fact that we were able to do a lot of collaboration with those social media pages and also um, provide some kind of sense of um, positivity about those different stories that the volunteers had. 
And so we also try to tie in the story of self, not just talking about specifically Bernie Sanders, but why different Bernie supporters were in the fight. And so we also were able to kind of create that narrative between the volunteers and the supporters when they were able to discuss why they were in the fight. And then the Bernie story um, message of the campaign allowed those volunteers to really utilize social media. And we kind of um, created this method of the, it's basically FOMO, the fear of missing an action. So having that presence on social media and working together really help um, recruit as much volunteers and supporters or even um, be able to recruit non-traditional um, voters to our social media pages. So it became kind of like a central hub to connect. And then from connecting on that social media outlet, then that's when we could go back to the campaign tools to do solid voter outreach. Thank you so much. Latoya, how, how is, uh, you know, the campaign you've working at and then where you've been working, kind of utilizing this in the different platforms and what platforms have you found to be most successful uh, in, in reaching out? Um, well, our strategy, um, a couple of our strategies, one is just a piggy bank off of um, what she was just saying, how there was already core bases of volunteers that have been doing their own grassroots. Um, so just collaborating with those people that were interested in certain policies um, that we were also fighting for as well. So connecting with them and also just looking at the different platforms available. I'm utilizing all of them. Um, so Facebook, you know, right now, you know, Know, the older population is, you know, more apt to jump on Facebook nowadays versus the younger generation. They're gearing more towards like the TikTok and the Snapchats. Um, so we are utilizing, you know, the Facebook to connect with more of the older voters, um, Instagram and TikTok and uh, the Snapchat to connect with the younger voters. YouTube is now replacing TV. Um, so we have a YouTube channel down here. It's the Trump card, um, Trump confessions. Um, we have, you know, volunteers and supporters just stating why they support President Trump. So utilizing that video um, platform as well with YouTube, um, as well as LinkedIn, a lot of business professionals and, you know, a lot of um, entrepreneurs and college students are using LinkedIn, a more professional platform platform. So just kind of pinpointing why, you know, where to focus your efforts on, you know, this side of the fence and that side of the fence and kind of utilizing different platforms to get your message out to the different audiences. Um, so I'm not sticking with one. I'm utilizing all of them. They're all free um, to you to advertise through. And you can connect with so many different types of people um, based on where you're putting your message at. So I think utilizing them all is important and just knowing your audience for each of them and what you're saying to them will give you the great well thank you all so much so we're coming near the end so i'm gonna do just a, a quick one minute i'm gonna give you i'm gonna ask one question i'm just gonna go through you all uh to get about a one minute response um and then after that i think we're gonna start trying to to move over a little bit to some of the questions and answers and in, in about you know just a couple minutes i might have one final question but we'll see but one of the things that you all have been noticing there is, as I appreciate many of you were talking about the down ballot races, you know, obviously, uh, I think it's important for us to recognize that so much of politics, particularly in the United States and really across the world, is at the much local level. And so I'm hoping that some of our participants are either engaged in that, maybe running, maybe volunteering. But given the so many social media platforms that you all are talking about, I'm curious if, if you could just talk about how can you use them right now to help organize those volunteers. So many of you have said that you've already had volunteers on the ground, but if you're trying to gain volunteers for kind of a down ballot race, how could you use the, the current situation to reach out to them and where would you find them? Because obviously you're not holding rallies, you're not holding meet and greets. So where would you find some of these volunteers if you were trying to run? And we're going to work our way backwards. So Latoya, Annalie, um, and then Gwintar, and then uh, Edward, Matthew, and then Sam. That's going to be our, our backward for that. In about one minute, if you don't mind. Yep, I got you. Um, again, I'm just, I, we gain our volunteers at this moment by 
looking for people that are passionate about different types of policies that we're fighting for. You know, it's not necessarily the red or the blue. Right now, we're looking at people that are passionate about certain things that we're fighting for. And those, they already have a team. You know, for instance, the 2A movement, the Second Amendment, um, down here in Virginia, we were, you know, getting a little threatened with, you know, some of our gun rights. Um, so they formed a huge volunteer base to fight for that. So just finding people that are, you know, on the same team of us, and that way we could grab, you know, hundreds of people um, at one time who are fighting for the same goal in mind. You know, so as far as pro-life issues, there's so many people that are fighting for that. So we're focusing, I'm focusing on policy at this point, because that's what people are, you know, are passionate about, you know, you may be passionate about the 2A while a mother may be passionate about pro-life. So trying to combine those two may not work. But when I pinpoint your passion that you may fight for, you're going to be willing to grab as many volunteers and supporters as possible. So just individualizing people and what they're passionate about and what they're looking to fight for. So we do have one goal in mind. I think that's most important for what we're doing down here in the third district is just grabbing people who are on the same side on policy issues and then bringing them over to the team. Because initially that's what we're voting for is specific policies and not just a person. Thank you. Annalie? Yes, specifically in the response of the age of pandemic, we're really trying to respond with the current situations that are happening all across the working class right now. So specifically essential workers, a lot of the different individuals that we were targeting primarily in the campaign were Amazon workers, were grocery store workers. Those were the solid um, donors that we had in the Bernie Sanders campaign. And realistically, now they are rising and organizing themselves in the workplace um, in a significant moment for ensuring that they had the same policies that we were advocating at a national level. And so what we're really trying to do is how are we gonna be able to empower them, provide them the resources to um, be able to succeed in their endeavors in the workplace, but then also highlighting key constituencies in the lower uh, middle class um, sector. And so being able to understand that, yes, we do have a solidarity happening right now in the workplace, right? And so we wanna make sure that we identify Latino leaders, we identify African-American leaders, different individuals that are also being subjected to like hate groups at this time. And so we wanna make sure that we want to identify realistically, how can we respond to the economic crisis, but also the social justice issues that are happening on top of those oppressions. Thank you so much. Uh, Gwinter. So my volunteers are basically there, but what would I observe? Uh, what would I observe for the party in general is that we have two, uh, basically two types of the volunteers: is those that are in active aid pro as active aid providers at this pandemic times, those that you know would go on the street with the register, as you know we have several uh, nationwide movements. Uh, in assistance uh, in fighting COVID-19. So we have many, many party members that are and volunteers that are actually also the members of those groups. So those that are actually on the ground, on the field, you know, helping to, uh, to combat the, um, the virus. Uh, and then the second group who are like the thinkers uh, and more of those who are, tend to analyze situation and pro, um, suggest uh, the good solutions in how to manage the crisis so basically these are two groups which both care but they participate in the different um, at the different level or by the different means and they are both who are actually the volunteers or those that you know standing as frontliners to become the volunteers um, in political campaign thank you so much edward well it, it's uh, what what the last several speakers just said pretty much uh, what, to add to it, perhaps, uh, I, if I were a down ballot candidate and I consult with many down ballot candidates in terms of training at this stage in the game, my focus would be on Facebook and Twitter. And pretty much that if you, you're charged with, if you have a, a lack of resources, which there aren't too many down ballot campaigns who aren't incumbents, uh, they all pretty much fit that bill. Uh, then Zoom technology coupled with, with those two platforms would, would be the way I would advise candidates to proceed. Uh, you can use those 
technologies to find influencers at this stage in the game. Because I, I think Matthew was quite right. At this stage in the game, unless you have something to offer in terms of a resource for the pandemic, probably folks are not going to be wanting to hear much of you. Unless you're an active uh, kind of person that, that uh, uh, the last couple of speakers referred to as activists in their own right, uh, you're probably best focused with the technology, those three platforms, and trying to recruit and have those folks build into their networks for the election as we head to the fall. Thank you. Matthew. Yeah, I, I think what, what we've done on several races that we're working on right now, so we have for instance, uh, some of the work we do, we're based out of Texas, and some, some of the work that we're doing right now is on Texas runoff elections, which were moved from the end of May to July 14th. So we're, we've got sort of an extended campaign time period that we weren't planning on. And what we've done in those races in particular is we've tried to, to help turn the campaign, whether they're an incumbent or a challenger or someone running in an open seat, again, focus on turning those campaigns into a resource mechanism. Mm. And we've, we've had a lot of success getting people to volunteer for the campaign in the efforts that they're doing. We, we've done a large text messaging campaign as well mm. to people in, in these districts, basically just asking them what, what they need. Uh, are they in need? Is there something we can do to help? And then work on the campaign logistics side of things with the volunteers you recruit through the text messaging process or through Facebook or through word of mouth or through calling seniors right now in their homes. Uh, take that volunteer group and put it to work on something very practical, whether that be food distribution or whether that be connecting people with, again, help at an unemployment office or whether that be putting them in contact with, um, you know, especially now as the economic impact of this continues to deepen, putting them in contact with job resources or different training programs, or even things like clinics on how to put together your resume, all those things you, you can use your volunteers to do. Um, and, and it, and it gets them ingrained in your campaign. And it also gets them connection in the community. So there, there really isn't, in my opinion right now, there's no excuse for anyone who's in the political process um, there's no excuse for them not to be fully engaged. Um, you know, people look to the folks who stand up in moments of trouble and crisis. And so whether you're a challenger, an open seat or an incumbent right now, you have to be engaged. The best way to get this job and many jobs is to act like you already have it, right? To get out there and, and really start serving the community. And that's what we've been encouraging people to do. Um, you know, in whatever way they can. Excellent. Thank you so much. Sam, uh, anything you want to add for one minute? And then we're going to turn it over to questions. So let me just quickly say, if you're a, a audience member, feel free to type any questions. If you haven't already, we're going to be going to your questions for the panel uh, in just a moment. But, but Sam, uh, anything you want to add to this? Sure. I think a lot of great things have been said here. In fact, most things have been said. But, uh, you know, the challenge in... Uh, any campaign at any time is making use of volunteers and making volunteers feel useful and be useful. And, you know, from the old days when it was just folks stuffing envelopes to, to making phone calls to nowadays with social media activism and other things. Um, in the age of the pandemic, when we're dealing with uh, a sense of isolation that is unprecedented, I think having people uh, uh, express themselves and feel connected is sometimes the most important thing. And I think Anna Lee made a good point about the, the Bernie Sanders campaign where people would tell their stories and tell how they related to the larger purpose of the campaign. That connectivity is critical. And then just in terms of mediums, um, this, is, this is a time where Instagram matters because you can put yourself in the picture and particularly for down ballot candidates uh, it, at the community level, when you can say, we have a senior facility in our community, what can we do to bring a little light into the lives of those people in the senior facility and take a picture of that and show that on Instagram. And those are the sorts of things people are hungering for right now. They're looking for inspiration. They're looking for 
activity and they're looking for things they can do. So the, the new leadership right now is gonna be those campaigns that are able to put all that together. Great, thank you all so much. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Kyle Griffith, Kyle Griffith, Kylan Giffrey, Kylan, I'm sorry, Kylan Griffith, uh, who is now going to uh, give us some audience questions. Um, I don't know what they are, so I'm gonna let her direct them to who they are and, and she's gonna take over for a moment. Okay, so I'm gonna start with just a general question. Um, this comes from Dr. Stephen King, another Regent University professor. So how does this new digitally based political communi communication platform or process positively or negatively affect or impact minority voters, low income voters and other voters who are otherwise physically or otherwise isolated? And let's, uh, let's go in the same order we just did. So uh, actually, I'm going to just go, I'm going to just choose a couple of these. Go with Annalie uh, and LaToya, um, and then uh, uh, Sam on those. We'll just go those three for that question. Oh, yes. Um, specifically, when we were doing a lot of organizing in New York City with the Bernie Sanders campaign, I was one of the staffers from the California primary that was relocated to New York. And that was one of the biggest issues we were having with our solid core volunteers was how are we going to be able to reach out to minorities? Um, there was the fear of not being able to use literature as a main source of door knocking. How are we, un how are we going to be able to make connections with individuals that don't have a smartphone, that don't have, you know, broadband connectivity, even in rural areas? And so being able to identify specifically, um, we were looking at different um, low income housing, federal housing um, services on how we could be able to utilize the campaign um, data tools, specifically, if you were to canvas um, a neighborhood, you would utilize um, different um, apps that we had on the campaign to do canvassing. So instead of doing canvassing through an app, we were actually trying to create a different method to do phone bank canvassing in those specific areas where we know that there was going to be a high flux of minorities that wouldn't necessarily respond to the traditional social media outlets and by doing actual one-on-one -on -one, um, contact with them through virtual phone banks. And so it was a really hyper-focused um, tool that we were going to be able to utilize in um, New York City. And then so it just became um, really difficult to see how we were going to be able to build capacity under Corona as well. And so being realistic about some of these individuals in these communities need more than just um, political outreach. They need more resources to even survive their daily lives. Thank you. Latoya? Um, as far as the minority community in my district, um, I don't, besides just communicating with them in general, like anybody else, I don't see a problem with them having connection to the internet um, or social media or smartphones. Um, um, the majority of the people here um, are all you know, educated to some point. I mean, there are, you know, some mis you know, misfortunate individuals that we are, you know, connecting with, you know, again, social media, um, as well as phone calls. Um, but as far as just specifically, how are we reaching out to minorities who are less fortunate that can't see social media? I don't have a, I don't have a problem with that here. Sam? Okay. I'm gonna sound like I'm really feeling the burn here. I'm a conservative, but I wanna give another shout out to the Bernie Sanders campaign. Because one of the things I do is uh, I, I, I do tutoring and there's a young woman through a uh, homeless teen program that I work with. And uh, she wanted to get involved in, in canvassing and politicking. This was before COVID, but uh, still it, uh, she, she was focused towards the Bernie Sanders candidacy. And she was able to do that despite the fact she didn't even have a home. All she had was a cell phone. And some of that ver some of that phone banking that Anna Lee was just talking about. Here's a home a young homeless woman, uh, you know, who's just barely able to make ends meet, who was able to participate in that way. And uh, one organization that I, I work with is uh, another organization I work with uh, deals with those who are in prison, and uh, that's an area where depending on what state you're in, um, prisoners can vote. 
in my home state of Maine, they can vote. Uh, and here in the District of Columbia, where I'm, I'm based, they can also vote. So when you're talking about people who have been so disenfranchised from political and civic life, and you're just simply giving them the opportunity to do something as simple as vote, um, that, you know, that, that's a powerful tool. And, you know, I don't know that any social media necessarily works there because in prison, you're not allowed to have social media, uh, but just using what opportunities uh, are available to, to outreach and do the simplest things in terms of registration to vote and educating people how to vote, uh, that can make a big difference in reaching people who would otherwise not be reached. Thank you. Tyler, back to you. I have a comment on that, oh. uh, Nick, for a sec. Uh, again, uh, back to, uh, I teach several courses. Uh, they all started out as face-to-face -face courses, and they ended up as online courses, uh, the, the, taking the students uh, by surprise. Uh, what it did expose, uh, and that I think is ref can help us reflect on uh, the campaign availability of technology, is that a, a fair number of my students only had smartphones to access uh, the the uh, digital platforms we're speaking about. Uh, and some of them had internet connections in their home uh, that, uh, but there was only one laptop or one PC available. Uh, and they had to share that with the rest of the folks in the family or whoever they, they're uh, locked down with. And so this exposed, uh, at least to my thinking, the choke points of the technology. Uh, you, it's hard to conduct a Zoom meeting on a cell phone is, is what I'm suggesting. So an influencer uh, will have that difficulty at the, the choke point. And this even is some of the more well-to-do uh, families of the students uh, that, that I instruct. Uh, so I just wanted to add that to the mix. Thank you, Edward. Thank you so much. Kylan, back to you. Yeah, so this is a question from a Regina University student who is wondering how you guys are, have been trying to deal with foreign influencers who are trying to affect the election through both traditional and social media. Okay, uh, I'm gonna, I, I appreciate, I'm gonna just change that slightly to how do you deal with people who are kind of trying to influence against your position, whether it's foreign or other parties through social media and how do you counteract some of those, those things? Because obviously, uh, not everyone's dealing on a national level here, but uh, let me let me go to uh, Matthew on this, um, and then Edward, if you don't mind, I, I think you might have something to say to this. And and Guintar, uh, obviously, you are from another country, so obviously you do want Lithuania. But how do you deal with people who are trying to uh, influence uh, your candidacy, your candidacy, and and your party's candidates um, from from outside areas and break through that noise? So Matthew, Edward, and then Guintar. Yeah. The You've got, I mean, you know, the people talk about like internet trolls, right? So this is a term that's thrown a lot around a lot, maybe not a great term, but you know, people that are just w wanting to instigate and wanting to uh, to start a fight. And so we we have some rules that we encourage our different candidates and the people who work for them to follow. Uh, first of all, we, we don't put up with anything, um, you know, that's that's racist or violent or sexually explicit. Um, and, and you would be surprised at the number of, of people that that try and sort of engage with pages um, from those perspectives. And so those those folks, we don't engage with at all. We mute them or we we block them so that they, they can't sort of corrupt a conversation. Uh, but what we always encourage our candidates to do is if, if there's a if there's a question that's being offered, even if it's a very pointed question, um, even if it's one that is difficult to answer, you know, engage with it uh, to the extent that you can. And, and a lot of times what we try and do is, you know, have the candidate talk a little bit with these folks if they've asked a question on Facebook or you know, that, that's really where you see this the most, right? Or, you know, they've sent in an email. Engage with them a little bit and then also try and take the conversation even offline. Uh, what we found the most is if, if someone's really passionate about a specific issue uh, in the community and a candidate is willing to engage with them one-on-one -on -one over that issue and then the candidate goes the step further of saying, 
here's my phone number, or here's a way that we can talk. Let's talk about this. Again, you know, anyone trying to reach out to a campaign, there's going to be people doing this for opposition research purposes, where they're just trying to gain information on you. There's going to be people doing this with no intention of having a conversation. But if you start with a broad enough filter, you can start actually really having a good impact with voters because there's going to be some people who, you know, for whatever reason, you know, they, they are, they are passionate about X, Y, or Z. And if you can engage with them on it, even if you don't ultimately agree with them, if you can show that as a candidate, you can listen. And if you could show as a candidate that you can be responsive, that's oftentimes what people are looking for even more than specific policy positions. People want to know that they're being heard. People want to know that their opinion is being valued. And so even if you can't agree with them at the end of the day, if you take them through a process and show them respect, uh, oftentimes you can be successful. Thank you so much. Uh, Edward. Yeah, I'm gonna dovetail again on what Matthew just had to say. Uh, what service, any kind of service, but customer service training tells you is to acknowledge the emotion. And I quite agree that uh, acknowledging the emotion is is the best signal that you can give to folks that both agree with you and disagree with you. Uh, if if I didn't have folks that were opposing me on the issues, not the not the folks that are off base and, and want to uh, just throw names, uh, but if I didn't have folks that disagreed with me, I'd look for them. And, and if I were a candidate, and my encouragement, it, that's the debate that people want to see. And that's the difference between a plastic candidate and a candidate that is authentic. And that's the, the probably the underlining uh, icon that people want to see in a candidate. They want to see a candidate who's an authentic candidate these days. It's probably the strength of, of uh, Senator Sanders and the strength of the current president that uh, for all the faults that they might bring, they're perceived as authentic by millions. Thank you so much, Edward. Uh, Guintar, uh, I'm just curious on, on your side, how do you deal with, you know, things like internet trolls and, and messengers that are maybe trying to influence from outside your area, outside your district, um, you know, trying to kind of take away your message and your interaction? Well, first of all, in a tough way, <laughs> that's the general Lithuanian approach on the foreign influences. If we speak uh, uh, the big, uh, big Russian beer uh, here on our borders. Uh, first of all, Lithuania is quite monogamous uh, country, uh, as well as uh, most of the Northern European countries. So, you know, inside, we don't even allow by law the any foreign influences uh, to happen, especially coming from different countries like the Russian Federation. So for us, it's also uh, the issue of the uh, national security. And we really have big effort being put in to avoid the, in particular, the uh, foreign influences when it comes to two officially recognized uh, state threats. This is the Russian Federation and the Chinese. Trust me, they have so many trolls. They have so many tool, other tools uh, how to try to intervene um, our elections and also how to shape the opinions and how to, you know, encourage um, separate groups in the society to, you know, without themselves knowing that, to try to engage and, you know, in that way to um, distract the uh, election environment, let's say, you know, the fair and democratic election uh, environment. Um, nevertheless, we are also part of the very um, international society, which is being members of the European Union. So what is really common in Europe is to use the support uh, or to rely on this, even sometimes to rely on the support uh, that you would find in the international um, system parties or like um, so-called umbrella parties, like say center-right would have them. It's like as European People's Party uh, leftists would have theirs, the European um, Social Democrats, you would have all the at the liberal front, you know, so it's quite common that candidates, especially that are known abroad, like myself, and, you know, not as much known inside their own countries would also use the support uh, of their international allies. To give you an example, one of the main volunteers in my, com uh, in my campaign, who will also be the head of my campaign, is a quite known uh, American political uh, consultant. So 
So that's how we deal. If that's bad influence, we deal it in a tough way. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. I think that's I think that's excellent. Okay, we're coming into the last 10 minutes. So Kylan, uh, if you can find maybe one really good question and uh, we'll see if we can give everyone again, maybe one to two minute response time to it. Okay, so here's the final question. This comes from Dr. Nolte. He um, says that one of the lessons learned from the recent primary season is that social media can magnify some voices while minimizing others. Specifically, Democrats on social media were overwhelmingly more white, educated, and progressive than the electorate as a whole. How, if at all, has lockdown changed that dynamic? Are there other critical political blocks that are not being heard right now because of other groups on social media taking up the oxygen? Yeah, I think this is a great question. It kind of combines a lot of the things we've been talking about. Um, so. Uh, just in the last kind of two minutes, I'm going to go in order again, and uh, we're just going to go kind of the order I started with. So we'll go Sam, Matthew, Guintar, uh, Edward, Annalise, and then Latoya will be the, the last person. So Sam? Uh, well, I think this is, it, it kind of cuts two ways. Um, you've got more of an equalization now because more people have time on their hands, uh, particularly in the uh, in the quarantine. So whereas, uh, you know, you, you, you had a, a different uh, ban of, uh, of participants in social media, um, talking to themselves, talking to sort of, you know, a, a, as the questioner mentioned, uh, liberal Democrats, uh, highly educated, uh, highly white, talking uh, on a level that did not, you know, extend beyond their area. Now we've got everybody online, almost everybody, with the exception of those people who are out there working to keep all of us, uh, you know, with food on our table. And those who are, you know, working in grocery stores, those who are working in food processing plants, those who are trucking our food across the country, and of course, healthcare workers. These are people who don't have time to be on social media. So while the, the, the universe of social media uh, actors has grown, uh, some critical parts are still missing. Um, and so I think we still do have a stratification. It's a different stratification. In a way, we have the ability to talk to more people on social media, but we're still missing others. And we have to figure out a way of integrating those as well. Thank you so much. Matthew? Yeah, I, I, I think Sam does a good job outlining the, the, the fact that we've had this explosion of, of use, um, maybe not in terms of people getting online for the first time, but engaging daily or multiple times a day with their, their social media networks. Um, I, the main difference I see isn't so much, you know, are there, you know, there's always going to be groups of people who will have a more difficult time having their voice heard. And, and we have to do what we can, you know, as political professionals to both reach out to those folks and, and to help them uh, to be able to formulate a voice. You know, what, what I think is, is really a bigger issue right now isn't so much who's excluded, but that what we're talking about is very different than what it was a month and a half ago. You know, the Twitter is still kind of a vicious and awful place to live um, from a, you know, public discourse standpoint, but people have become a little more serious about what outrages them um, and have become a little bit more, um, accepting of the, the limits of, of human uh, knowledge uh, and, and expertise. And it, it's, you know, we're, we're now disturbed by different things. Uh, whereas everyone's concerns, in my opinion, just my opinion, we're getting kind of uh, obscure and to use an almost an old term precious, right? They're, they're very limited in nature and very sort of rooted in our own experience. We are now forced to have a uh, concern more broadly about something that really matters yeah. immediately and every day. And I think that if, if there is, you know, some of the positives that come out of this, because there hopefully and surely will be some, maybe it's that the seriousness of American discourse might return a little bit um, because we have, real, we have real problems that we need to solve. 
Thank you, Matthew. Okay, so we've got about uh, three minutes left. So that's about one minute for each of the other panelists. So I'm, I'm going to ask if you could just talk really quickly. Do you think that there are voices that are not being uh, properly heard? And, and who do you think they are? So, uh, Gwinter? Well, that's actually a very complicated question, because if they are not heard, so how can we know about their existence, uh, philosophically uh, speaking? But uh, I think that more or less all the groups in the society are being uh, represented in the social media, uh, that is for sure. And even more, I would like to also take a little bit different uh, angle on this new reality. I see it as a new wave of, um, on, on, of the rise of the conservatism. Don't forget that you know being on the social media is also being in the community, which is you know a main, um, a main thing uh, between the individual and the state. So I think being on social media in different groups is also the way how we can uh, be the part of the different uh, communities and why not online. Thank you so much. Uh, Edward. Well, I, I think in a nutshell, it boils down to opportunity. I think the opportunity is affordable. It's there for most everyone in our society, particularly in the United States. And I, the, the real challenge is breaking out of the silos of the folks that we keep talking to that we're singing to the same folks in the same choir. Breaking out of the silos into other new networks is the challenge. And then I do think that everybody has a comparable opportunity. Sure, thank you so much. Emily. Yes, I feel that people right now on the social media aspect of what they're voicing out, they're voicing out their frustrations. And so on social media, you see people responding to the current status quo. And I feel like with the different issues happening specifically with housing at this moment, with people afraid on how they're able to even afford rent at this moment, or student accessibility as well, student loan crisis. And so I, I feel like right now, you are seeing a lot more vocal individuals to highlight their frustrations, and specifically the voices that are being left out. I definitely see a lot of centrist um, individuals right now, not necessarily having a platform to speak on. And so right now, you're definitely going to see um, little um, reflection from them at this point. Right. Latoya. I think it's, it's important to remember um, about algorithms um, when we're dealing with social media. Um, you're going to see what you're searching for at some point. So for the people, for the ones that are necessarily unheard or not being seen, it could just necessarily be the fact that you're just gonna constantly see what you're searching for due to the algorithms. Um, I mean, it's it's everywhere, even with the Google. I mean, you say cupcakes, and next thing you know, you'll see ads for cupcakes. You're scrolling down Facebook and you'll see cupcakes. I mean, so you have to be aware when we're talking about social media and what it is that you're seeing and what it is that you're not seeing. It's all, it's filtered by what you're looking for, by your interest. And it's also could be filtered by the creators of Facebook. I mean, we've seen it here in Virginia um, where they literally said that they were shutting down all Facebook pages that were going against the government. Um, so when we're looking at silencing and who's being seen and who's not, it's more than just them not putting their name out there. It could be, you know, outside influences and it could be themselves as well, that the reason why they're not seeing other things besides what they're interested in. Excellent. Well, thank you all so much. I, I really appreciate this panel. I think that there's been a lot of thoughtful engagement on the topic. Uh, I'm hoping that the people who are able to observe will learn um, and themselves be able to participate as volunteers, as uh, people working on campaigns. Um, and I think, you know, Latoya ended on a great point, which is that one of the things that we do need to remember, and I think Sam mentioned this at the beginning as well, is that there are places out there that these social interactions are kind of private owned spheres. And so there's always going to be some influence over whose voices are going to be heard through different mechanisms. And so one of the things to recognize is that we who hold the public sphere so important need to recognize that the tools that we use are going to have within them their own sort of uh, issues that we may need to think about. And so uh, I really appreciate that. I'm gonna hand it over to Stephen Perry, 
uh, the Dean of Robertson School of Government, who's the host of all of these excellent panels. Uh, Dr. Perry, uh, please come on in and I'll let you conclude us. Yes, thank you very much. This has been great. Thank you to all of our panelists, uh, Gintar, for uh, supporting us from Lithuania and, and just to be part of this discussion. You know, COVID is affecting the whole world and we just are so glad you were able to bring in perspective from there. For our folks that are working on campaigns, Annalia and Latoya, thank you for, for your participation as well. You know, and I think all the things that all of our experts have shared today, you you guys are gonna be contributing to our new, uh, we have a new concentration in campaign management strategies in our master's in government program. And I, I think a lot of this material is gonna end up uh, being shown to our students as we move forward, because this has just been, has been very good. So thank you to Matthew and Sam and Edward as well for all of your expertise in this. And uh, just uh, if you're like me, you just got an email because you're registered for this conference telling you about our next panel tomorrow, or not our next one, but our panel tomorrow, because I got the one day notice, but we do have a panel coming up at one o'clock Eastern time, United States. Uh, that'd be five o'clock Greenwich Mean Time. That's finding and reaching your majority from six feet away. So that's like 90 minutes from now. So we just invite you to uh, come back, but you know, if you're if you're over in Lithuania, you're going to have to get dinner in the meantime. And if you're here in the United States, grab some lunch. And uh, we look forward to having you join us then. So uh, for all of us in the Roberts School of Government and for all of our panelists, thank you to our audience for attending. And we look forward to having you back for our next panel. God bless. Bye.